Hello, everyone. This is Ed Gramlick from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. I have just been talking at you for like seven or eight minutes, and um, I was informed that no one could hear me. Uh, I'm not sure why they waited so long, uh, <laughs> but um, I'm going to do uh, thank you for being patient uh, during that um, seven or eight minute uh, dark, uh, dark web. Uh, but uh, I'm going to start all over again. Um, with a, a basic introduction. So I've got some rehearsal time done here. So uh, again, welcome to this webinar about the proposed Section 3 uh, regulations. Just to be clear, this webinar will only talk about the public housing parts of the proposed Section 3 regulation because the primary intent of this webinar is to inform residents about Section 3 and to get resident uh, feedback. Uh, there are other parts of the proposed Section 3 rule that cities, counties, and states must follow if they are getting CDBG and home dollars, as well as some other smaller uh, HUD dollars. Even though um, uh, you might be a resident, uh, you, residents still might want to become familiar with those other parts too, because there, are, uh, there should be employment and training opportunities with CDBG and home and, and those other programs. I have a summary that covers both parts, and we will send it out to everyone who registered for the webinar. Now, next week, we will send you a sample comment letter that you can tailor to your own situation. We really urge everyone to write to HUD telling HUD what you think is good, bad, or otherwise needs changing with the proposed Section 3 rule. Those comments are due on June 3rd. Now, there's a lot of information to cover uh, just on the slides alone and even more in the two summaries that you will get after the webinar. I won't have time to even go through all of today's slides or even uh, every line on my slides, but all of the slides will be available after the webinar as, as will a recording that we are making of this uh, webinar. My plan today is to spend about 30 minutes explaining the most important features of the public housing portions of the proposed Section 3 regulation. But don't worry, I won't be yammering at you for a solid 30 minutes. I will be stopping every once in a while uh, to get your feedback. Now, it seems like a lot of local government, and nonprofit, and even HUD staff have signed up for this webinar. Uh, we really, really want this webinar to be an opportunity for residents, public housing residents, uh, Section 8 residents, and other tenants to have ask questions and to give us feedback so that we can shape our comments to HUD. So if you are not a resident but would like to provide us with your feedback, please just write to me directly at ed at n-l-i-h-c dot o-r-g. Uh, and that uh, uh, email is also on the last slide of, of the, the webinar. So speaking of feedback, I will now ask Brooke to explain to residents how they can provide feedback or ask questions during the webinar. Thanks, Ed. Good afternoon, everyone. Throughout today's webinar, you'll be able to ask questions and make suggestions like Ed said. There are two ways to do this through the control panel on your screen. The first is by using the questions box. You may type a question at any time, and when we pause for questions, we will answer those that have been submitted so far. The second is by using the hand raising tool. This is next to the audio box on your screen and is a drawing of a hand with a green arrow. When you click this, we will be notified that you are raising your hand and we will be able to unmute your line so that you can ask a question or make a suggestion. Ed has a lot of great info to share with you and we have a lot of people participating in today's webinar. So if you do use the hand raising tool, Please be sure to keep your questions or suggestions brief so we can be sure to get through everything. Thanks again for joining, and Ed can take it away. Thank you, Brooke. And now on with the show. Uh, I'm assuming that most people on this uh, webinar are, are familiar with Section 3, but just to be sure, uh, I'm going to give you a very brief uh, description of it. Section 3 actually refer refers to the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968. So it's been law since 1968. It states that when HUD funds are used to assist housing and community development projects, preference for some of the jobs, training, and contracting opportunities created by that HUD funding should go to low-income people, particularly uh, recipients of housing assistance and to businesses that are owned or controlled by low-income people or to businesses that hire them. All of this is to the greatest extent um, feasible. 
Public housing agencies must comply with Section 3, and PHAs have to ensure that their contractors and subcontractors also comply. On April 4th of this year, HUD published a proposed rule that updates the 1994 interim Section 3 rule. We've been operating on that 1994 interim rule since then. As I said before, comments are due on June 3rd. Now, the first issue that I would like to discuss uh, with you and get your thoughts about is that HUD proposes to remove Section 3 from the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, FHEO. That monitoring and enforcement uh, will now is proposed to be moved to the Office of Public and Indian Housing for public housing, the Office of Community Planning and Development, CPD, for CDBG, home, and some other smaller uh, uh, programs, and then finally, the Office of Recapitalization for Rental Assistance Demonstration, or RAD, uh, uh, Rehab, or New Construction. Which of these offices that uh, will be involved will largely be determined by the funds that a particular project receives that tr actually triggers the obligation to comply with Section uh, with uh, Section 3. Just a side note uh, for RAD, once the public housing construction is done and the conversion is made to project-based vouchers or project-based rental assistance, Section 3 will no longer apply. So this means that former public housing staff might not actually be covered by Section 3 after a RAD conversion. Now, uh, I've heard in the past uh, directly from FHO field staff people that uh, they have complained to the, the other program offices that uh, those other program offices like PIH, like CPD, are just not responsive to uh, Section 3 problems. So given that, um, we are proposing to recommend that Section 3 monitoring and enforcement should be done by HUD staff who are independent of the HUD program offices, independent of PIH, independent of CPD, independent of uh, recapitalization. The proposed rule was actually issued by something called the Office of Field Policy and Management. Uh, so I'm assuming that particular office in HUD uh, will be in charge of uh, overall charge of Section 3. Now, I'm going to come back to this issue in a minute to ask your feedback, but first, there's a related but much more troubling issue. Um, the proposed rule would eliminate any Section 3 specific complaint process. It would rely on existing provisions in these other HUD programs uh, to address resident complaints. Now, the current rule, the one, the 1994 rule, has an entire section about complaints, including a section that details for residents on how they can submit a complaint. Uh, on the other hand, the other HUD program areas like PIH and CPD do not have detailed provisions for residents to register a PHA's or a jurisdiction's failure to meet a program requirement, much less a Section 3 complaint. So, uh, I think we are going to be prepared to uh, uh, re suggest that a detailed complaint process identical to or very similar to the one used under the current rule should be included in each of these federal program areas, PIH and CPD, but enforced perhaps by that Office of Field Management and Policy. However, it's not really clear that the Office of Field Management Policy has the staff capacity or even the technical knowledge to oversee Section 3 monitoring and enforcement. So maybe we should be thinking about keeping Section 3 at the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Either way, whatever independent office monitors and enforces Section 3 will need to have a lot more staff, and that's going to be a, a challenge. Okay, now... Um, I'm going to stop talking for a minute, and we're going to ask for feedback uh, from you all. Um, but, but just a reminder, we this is really for residents only. Um, so if you're not a resident, please don't uh, uh, offer feedback this way. Go write me directly at ed at nlic.org. And if you are a resident and you uh, uh, want to give a comment or ask a question, particularly about what I've just said, um, please uh, let us know whether or not you're a public housing resident, a voucher resident, or a project-based rental assistance resident, or some other uh, low-income tenant, and maybe where you, where you live. 
So I'm going to ask Brooke to remind people again how they can, there are two ways to, to um, register uh, your, your questions and your suggestions. Go ahead, go ahead Brooke, remind people. Sure. Um, the first is by using the questions box. You may type a question there um, and we'll see it show up on our screen here. The second is by using the hand raising tool. This is next to the audio box on your screen and is a drawing of a hand with a green arrow. When you click that, it will show that you are raising your hand and we will be, un we will be able to unmute your line so that you can ask a question or make a suggestion. So it does look like we have a couple of hands raised, Ed, if you want me to go ahead and unmute one at a time here. Just, well, just let me say that sure. uh, these are the two questions I'm posing. This is kind of based on what I've just talked about. So I like your specific feedback back about this particular stuff. You may have some other questions and su some suggestions about other stuff, but wait till we get to that uh, part of the webinar. And also, I would just want to remind people that this is not going to be your only chance to give us feedback on this topic or any of the other topics I ask for feedback on. If you think of something later, you can always write to m your suggestions to me. Uh, my email address, again, is at the end of the slide. Um, it, but again, simply ed at N-L-I-H-C. And again, a reminder, please keep your uh, suggestions as brief as possible so that we can accommodate as many people as possible. Okay, Brooke. Sure. Uh, so it looks like we have a question from Charlene Nimmons. Uh, she recommends that the 958 complaint form should remain in place under FHEO. And that 958 form is, is the, you know, the, the uh, well-received uh, um, format that uh, uh, residents like and that advocates have uh, uh, achieved some improvements on in, in, re in recent years. So thank you, Charlene. And we have a, um, a Stacy Cronebush raising her hand. I'm going to unmute your line, Stacy, if you would like to ask your question. Um, Stacy, are you there? It's not letting me unmute her line. Here we go. Let's try Mrs. Brown. Hi, Mrs. Brown, are you there? I'm here. Good afternoon. Great. What, is, what is your question or feedback? My question is, it does not matter to me where Section 3 is housed, whether it's PIH or uh, Fair Housing. My concern is enforcement, monitoring, and oversight. That is the issue. 958 complaint needs to stay in place, but we must have enforcement, oversight, and monitoring. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. All right. Uh, as a voucher, this comes from Alicia Sims. As a voucher holding resident, who chairs an organization who has a successful Section 3, my concern is whether or not residents will have a chance to participate if moved to other agencies. I mean, that, that's a good, that's a, a good concern. Um, actually, and actually, would you mind, mind tell me where you're from? Because I always want to hear about successful Section 3 uh, programs. Um, so, because so many of the, the instances I hear about are there's not much going on. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yep. Okay. Well, that's because Bob Dame was there. <laughs> uh, we have a Patrice Shelton. Patrice, are you there? Patrice? I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Patrice. We're going to try moving on to one other person. And I will remind people that um, when we... Uh, once you've asked your question, if you want to put your hand back down, click the hand tool again and it will lower your hand so we know that you no longer have a question. Let's try Patrice one more time. I'm sorry, Patrice, I'm not able to unmute you at this time. If you want to type your question into the question box, we'll try to get at it later. Otherwise, I'm not seeing any others at this time, Ed. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Now, um, I will continue. Uh, the next topic that I would like to discuss um, is the fact that HUD proposes to use labor hours work instead of new hires. 
the current rule has a goal of having 30% of the new hires be Section 3 residents. Uh, there are a lot of past problems using uh, new hires. You can see three examples on the slide. I won't read them all off. Basically, contractors have used various means to undermine or completely evade complying with Section 3. Now, when later on in the webinar we discuss so-called benchmarks, um, we will see that HUD is proposing that Section 3 workers make up 30% of the total uh, hours worked by all workers. This is almost exactly what advocates have long wanted to have happen. So we're making some progress, I think. However, um, advocates also strongly recommend that 30% of the hours worked should be measured for each job category or kind of construction trade. And in addition, that 15% of all hours worked should be filled by women for each of the job categories or, or construction trades. The reason why we, we add the, the emphasis on women is because women are vastly underrepresented in the construction trades. And section three, when you get right down to it, is mostly about construction related activities. Now, some PHAs have told us that they actually prefer using new hires. They don't, not, they don't want to go to labor hours worked. So HUD is offering PHAs something called Alternative 2 for using new hires. PHAs are asked by HUD to comment on which they actually want to use, and then HUD will later on decide if all PHAs, not just some, but all PHAs will have to use either new hires or the labor hours worked. Um, a lot of detail about Alternative 2 is described at the end of this slide presentation. Now, this, what I'm about to say is kind of preliminary, and, and uh, I think that the thinking keeps changing on this, and so it would be really helpful for you to get your ideas about this uh, in a minute. Uh, but after talking with some other advocates, we're thinking about recommending that PHAs use labor hours work for contractors who are carrying out major projects, such as major roof repairs, tuck pointing, uh, installing new elevators, stuff like that. But allow those PHAs to continue using new hires for their permanent PHA staff for maybe up to three years, but then after that uh, be required to use labor hours work for all of the PHA staff. It's kind of recognizing the fact that although there may be permanent uh, uh, PHA uh, staff, there's always going to be turnover in, in, in on, among that, that workforce. So I am going to stop again and specifically ask for what your thoughts are do you think your PHA should use new hires? Do you think that um, your PHA should uh, switch to labor hours worked? One other thing I want to mention is that uh, some of the advocates uh, who do this on a daily basis at the local level say that there is really inexpensive software uh, that anyone could use to uh, switch to a labor hours worked um, format. Okay, so I'm I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, but it looks like we have a Sone Devayan on the line. Sone, are you there? Yes. Thank I completely agree with your comments about labor hours, and I understand that labor hours are much better indicator to track, and including women in construction jobs. That's an effort and uh, some programs that we have implemented in our housing authority to do. But I would also like to make a comment that, um, especially for smaller agencies, it may be really hard to track labor hours and all these different indicators and benchmarks you're talking about an unfunded mandate that you know most agencies don't even have the um, capacity to have dedicated staff and now adding on all these different monitoring mechanisms and requirements it's going to be really hard administratively to do some of this tracking and monitoring to be able to report so I would want to know if there are any alternative, like software, like you mentioned just now, Ed, or any other things, too, to help the housing authorities with these additional requirements so that we are able to monitor easily for these projects and not to create a lot of administrative challenges to be able to do this. Because the intent is good and it's wonderful and we all should do that. It's just how are we going to be able to achieve that with the limited resources that we all have. 
I don't know about alternatives. That's uh, something to explore. And I think, uh, Son, I think you're from a, a PHA, so you might want to make uh, those comments when when you write to HUD. Um, we have. And, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know step in and say again, we really want to hear from residents and not PHAs and cities. Um, sorry, Son. <laughs> Uh, we have a Mrs. Brown again. Mrs. Brown, are you there? Uh, hi. Uh, the um, previous uh, caller, she was from a PHA and not a resident? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, before I give my comment, I want to say to her and, and all the other callers on the line, Motivation Inc. 678-794-3066 has the software to track labor hours already in place and they work with small PHAs as well as large PHAs and that's Motivation Inc. 678-794-3066. I have no vested interest in this company other than that they really serve the residents and PHAs. That, that's a Keith's outfit, right? That's Keith Swiney's outfit, correct? Yeah, yeah he Thank has you for more that information. Than 25 years of um, public housing experience. He's the go to person. Even HUD goes to him regarding um, training. Thank you. Okay, and we have uh, Alicia Sims uh, said that they would love to know what the software is. Right now, they have a form that the sub contractors fill out each week? Um, I don't know. I just heard that from other advocates. I can ask those other advocates, but uh, you heard Mrs. B say that um, Motivation Inc. Has, has that software, so you might want to follow up with Motivation Inc. I'm sure it's either going to be very inexpensive, if not, well, it probably isn't free, but it's probably very inexpensive. But I, I will ask uh, the, the couple advocates who actually mentioned that to me and get and and uh, we if once we learn uh, that we'll send it out to the uh, the people who've registered I have three people who have their hands raised but it does not look like they have an audio function so I don't know if that's something on your end you need to either call in or turn on your audio on um, your device uh, it's Stacy Cronbush Jennifer Mohawk and Rebecca Wachtel um, those were all of the questions related to this slide. We do have one question from the beginning, if you don't mind quickly, sure. uh, asking uh, what does to the greatest extent feasible mean uh, from the first slide? And sometimes, I mean, the, 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 the statute and the regulations use either to the greatest extent feasible. That's in the, the beginning part of the statute. But then when you get into talking about um, public housing stuff or the non-public housing stuff, they switch sometimes to best efforts, and there is no definition. Uh, and uh, the advocates that I'm working with are trying to wrestle with uh, what they think is best. Um, I and, and HUD in, in the, the preamble to the proposed rule is asking for people's ideas about what, uh, what should be preferable and maybe even a definition. So if you've got a good thought about that, uh, let us know or and, and or let uh, HUD know so that uh, we can begin to use it. I personally think it's going to be such a, um, a squishy thing that no one's going to be able to come up with a, you know, a good concrete definition that we can all uh, rely upon. I think the, the, the real answer is that people in the community, residents in the community have to challenge um, a PHA or a jurisdiction that you think is just not doing what it ought to do. And then you just say, because there's, there's no legal definition of to the greatest extent feasible our, our best efforts. I hope that helps. It doesn't really answer your question, but it gives you the context. All right. Ready to move forward. And again, for those three people who had their hands up but, but you know weren't able to uh, uh, verbalize their, their um, question or suggestion, again, Later on, you can uh, you, you just email me directly, and hopefully, we can get back to you, or and 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 let and uh, gather your your suggestions. So, uh, on to the next topic, um, 
and this has to do with small PHAs. Song kind of raised the issue a little bit ahead of time. Uh, HUD is proposing that small PHAs, those with less than 250 public housing units, uh, they're proposing that they would not have to report whether they have met uh, the benchmarks, and it's the second time I've mentioned benchmarks. Be patient with me, I'll get to it eventually. But in, in, for, for right now, let's say a benchmark is the number of labor hours worked or uh, the number of new hires that have been made. Um, for small PHAs, HUD is proposing that they only have to report qualitative efforts. And HUD gives some examples in the preamble to the proposed rule. Oh, let, me, let me kind of step back and say, uh, because I'm a regs nerd and I've been using that word preamble, I should probably define what that means. When HUD puts out uh, a proposed rule and even a final rule, it has a long general description of what is going on, kind of setting the tone before it gets into the kind of legalese actual text of the, the, the regulation. So the preamble, HUD's kind of just talking to us. So in the preamble, they give some examples of what might be considered qualitative efforts such as outreach to generate job applicants, uh, provide on-the-job training, and to provide outreach to find Section 3 businesses. So I'm going to stop again. And uh, I don't have a lot of experience with small PHAs. And um, I think Son kind of gave us uh, uh, some concerns that she had from a PHA's perspective. But I would really like to know what you as residents uh, think about exempting um, a small PHAs from having to uh, a report on either new hires or labor hours worked. I'm not seeing any questions or hands raised at this time. Again, the questions box is on your control panel and the hand raising tool is next to your control panel near the audio section. Right now, I'm sort of inclined to say no, small PHAs should not be exempt. I understand the uh, the, the issue that Son brought up in terms of uh, not having the staff capacity and all that, but maybe with if, if we can uh, if they can get access to that in uh, inexpensive software, maybe that transition can be made. We have a Gwen Walton. Gwen, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. What is your question or suggestion? Can't hear you. You were there for a second, but then you went away. I think she muted her line. Did you mute, mute your line, Gwen? Um, so we have, well, oh, oh, yeah. Gwen, are okay. you there? Well, I, was saying they should be, I was saying they should not be exempt. Small PJ should not be exempt. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have, also have uh, Cynthia Wiggins saying, I don't think, PHA should be, uh, I don't think any PHA should be exempt with the economic status and job loss. All PHA should be required to comply. Then we have uh, Adriana O'Neill. Small PHA should not be exempt. Uh, Bren, Brendan Saunders. For small PHAs, there should not be any exemption, but there should be the ability to show why they cannot meet Section 3 goals. Carolyn Bell says that, uh, oh, that was uh, not related to this. It was to the Motivation Inc. website. It indicates a training and technical assistance, but no software. Well, I think what for that, that uh, when just contact people at Motivation Inc. I think that then they'll want to talk to you, and then they'll talk Turkey about making it available to you and at what cost if any. All right. Is that it? Well, thank you very much. Uh, you guys have helped me feel much more confident about uh, suggesting that small PHAs not be exempt. Mrs. Brown also says that small PHAs should not be exempted. Thank you. Now on to something that is uh, going to be really important, a new topic called the Section 3 Worker. Uh, HUD would replace the current rules term Section 3 resident with something called a Section 3 worker who is someone who meets one of three possible criteria. 
So the first criteria is that a worker's income is less than the limit set by HUD for the program that's actually triggering Section 3. So, for example, if CDBG money is triggering Section 3, uh, someone would have to have an income limit less than 80% of the area median income, which frankly is quite high. Um, now, the current rule specifically lists as a Section 3 resident um, someone who is a public housing resident. Now, I suppose we can uh, assume that if you are a public housing resident or a Section 8 resident, whether it's a voucher or project-based rental assistance resident, by virtue of being one of those uh, residents, you are meeting the income definition. Um, I kind of think HUD is just trying to be generic that way. But I think uh, given uh, the, the, the intent of the law, HUD should actually specifically list public housing residents as a Section 3 worker, but also add Section 8 residents, whether they're voucher holders or PBRA residents, and residents of Section 811 housing, that's housing for people with disabilities, and Section 202 housing, which is housing for people who are elderly. Um, so uh, why am I thinking about adding all these other residents? Well, remember, the statute says particularly residents of housing assistance. Um, in addition, the rule should continue to use anyone whose income meets the definition of low income, but begin that section of the, of the, the, the text of the regulation by saying immediately prior to the date of hire. We are suggesting adding immediately prior uh, to the date of hiring language to imply that contractors and subcontractors shouldn't get credit for just paying low wages doesn't necessarily help prevent them from continuing to pay a Section 3 worker low wages later on. We can't really compel people to pay a living wage as much as we would like, uh, but at least by staying at the very beginning, um, b before they actually become a Section 3 worker, they're, um, they're immediately prior to being hired, they met these criteria as, of low income. Now, there's the second option for defining a Section 3 worker is one who lives in a so-called qualified census tract. This is a term that comes out of practice in the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. A QCT is a census tract that has a poverty rate greater than 25% or that has 50% of the households who have income less than 60% of the area median income. Now, a PHA or jurisdiction jurisdiction can't just say, oh, I'm going to make this a, a qualified census tract. HUD actually defines them uh, each year. HUD has to designate a census tract as a qualified census tract. So uh, in order to do this, uh, um, there's, there's, it's, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, for uh, some funny business to take place. Now, someone in a QCT is not necessarily going to be low income, depending on how, on how that census tract is drawn, a number of residents could actually be higher, excuse me, higher income people. Um, therefore, we think that the rule should not use this geographic area to define a Section 3 worker. Now on to the third option for defining a Section 3 worker. It is a worker who is employed by a Section 3 business. And uh, please bear with me, be patient. I will explain what a Section 3 business is in just a minute. Now, someone who is hired by a Section 3 business will not necessarily be low income or a public housing resident or Section 8 uh, resident. And you will, this will be apparent as soon as I get to the definition of uh, Section 3 business. We think that the rule should only consider public housing, Section 8, Section 811, and Section 202 residents or other low income people, especially women, as Section 3 workers. I'm going to skip the next slide just for the sake of time, next two slides actually, and get to another opportunity for feedback. Um, I was wondering if you all have any suggestions about the definition of Section 3 work. Um, I know I, this is kind of going to get more complicated, um, and if you don't have some thoughts right now, but you know tomorrow or next week when you do have some thoughts about this, after you've let it digest a little bit, um, by all means, please write to me. But let's see if we have any input right now from Brooke. Uh, we have a, a Gwen Walton. Uh, Gwen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. 
Yes, I'm great. What, what question or feedback do you have? Uh, I feel like a Section 3 worker should be anyone that's low income. Anyone that's not. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, repeat that. I feel like a Section 3 worker should be anyone who's low income. Anyone who's low income? Oh, okay. Yeah, you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to be. A, you shouldn't have to be a resident. It should be anyone who's low income. Thank you for that suggestion. And I, I, I might push back a little bit. I, I'm not going to dismiss your your suggestion, but you know the statute talks about you know particularly providing employment opportunities for people who are benefiting from housing assistance. Uh, that's why I would put. The, the you know public housing section eight and other residents first, then followed by other low income people. But I'll, I'll take your uh, your input and and give it some thought, and we'll kick it around here. Appreciate that. I'm not. Uh, oh, Mrs. Brown is saying her hand is raised. I'm sorry, Mrs. Brown. I am not seeing it on my screen here. Um. Can you try lowering it and, okay, here we go. There we go. Oh, it went away again. Can you try raising it one more time, Mrs. Brown? There you are. Okay, much. you are unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I Unfortunately, many people are confused uh, what is Section, Section 3 worker, and as you stated, the purpose of the Section 3 program in 1968 is to provide another avenue for people in public housing and Section 8 to move out of the housing developments to become self-sufficient. So any monies on projects that are set aside, uh, that are used by, that are given to that particular area, are funded, I should say, by HUD, CBG, et cetera, then uh, those folks who are in that direct location would have first priority. For example, the housing developments in that area would be the public housing residents, and then the Section 8, then the youth, and then the low-income residents. Unfortunately, in the proposed final rule, they want to change the tier. Uh, perhaps, Ed, you can speak to that a little bit more, and thank you. I will actually get to the, the, the tiers in, in a couple minutes. Thank you. Uh, Adriana O'Neill agrees that adding all public housing resident categories and low income workers uh, would be good, as well as prioritizing PHA residents. Uh, Francis Justinano, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. I believe the term Section 3 worker is too broad. Section 3 hires should be low income, et cetera. However, Section 3 business employees can be called Section 3 workers but do not fall under income provision. I agree. I agree. And, and this will become even more apparent now as we, unless there are other suggestions, we get into the Section 3 business part. We're good to go? Yep, I think that's it. All right. So let's move on to Section 3 business. Um, just a reminder that the statute says that a PHA must make best efforts to give preference in awarding uh, contracts to businesses that are owned or controlled by low-income people or that to businesses that hire a substantial number of low-income people. Now, the proposed rule makes some really dr dramatic changes from the existing rule when it comes to defining what a Section 3 business is. Um, there are three possibilities, there are three criteria. The first is 51% uh, of the business is owned by low-income people. This is exactly the same as the current rule, and it sort of tracks, reflects within the statute. The second option is that low-income people work more than 75% of the labor hours worked. This is new. And the third option is that 25% of the businesses are owned, excuse me, 25% of the business itself is owned by uh, public housing residents or Section 8 residents. So I, I've got no problem with the first one. Maybe you all do. Uh, I do want to talk about the second option. Uh, we think that businesses should not be rewarded for paying poverty wages. Therefore, I would make a, a, a friendly amendment to that section, that option two, 
saying that more than 75% of the labor hours worked at the business is performed by persons who were low or very low income immediately prior to the date of hire. Again, it just sends a signal that the intent is to uh, not continuously pay people uh, poverty wages. It doesn't, it doesn't solve that problem. It doesn't make people uh, pay a, a living wage, but it kind of sends a signal. Regarding option three, um, uh, that option should be that 51%, not 25%, 51% or more ownership by public housing or Section 8 residents. Anything less than 51% ownership is in danger of being a front for non-low-income uh, people. Uh, the other 75% owners could be regular business people who do not have any uh, the best interests of, of residents at heart. Um, in, in the past, uh, we've all observed, uh, advocates have observed that um, businesses that are supposed to be uh, minority-owned or women-owned uh, have uh, often bumped into front organizations and not really benefiting uh, um, minority uh, owners or uh, women owners. So uh, again, pausing for feedback. Um, any suggestions about the definitions of Section 3 and my proposed uh, uh, modifications. Uh, Mrs. Brown has her hand raised. Uh, let me unmute your line. Oh, okay. Hello, Mrs. Thank Brown, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here, thank you. I think it's important for uh, the residents to ask for technical assistance to become a resident-owned business. Many PHAs do not understand the difference between a Section 3 worker and a Section 3 resident-owned business. For example, in New York, NYCHA, they put all their emphasis on their resident engagement uh, program and their emphasis on Section 3 workers, not Section 3 resident-owned businesses. So I think it's important that it be included in the comments that technical assistance should be provided to residents who want to be a Section 3 resident-owned business and talk about self-certification and et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. B. Um, I, I, I agree. One problem we all are going to have is technical assistance calls, it requires money. Um, and as you all should know, there's no, no money comes with Section 3. It comes because the PHA is, is getting just regular operating funds and capital funds. Um, now, maybe the PHA can find a local uh, workforce uh, uh, training op, uh, organization, some other outside organization that can that's already getting paid to provide that kind of technical assistance. That's probably something to work to work towards. Also, you know, maybe uh, just because there's no money and, and, you know, we have difficulty with appropriations uh, these days, uh, it still wouldn't hurt for you all when you write your comments to say, and there ought to be appropriations for technical assistance so that um, uh, we can generate some successful resident-owned businesses. She followed up with a comment saying to partner with another agency. Ah, so I'm pretty smart because I was thinking about what Mrs. Brown was thinking. <laughs> uh, Charlene Nimmin says Section 3 business concern. Um, current law should remain the same with more enforcement in place. But the, uh, just a, uh, a technical thing, uh, the law is not changing, the, the, the regs are being proposed to change. So what you're saying really is keep the, the regs as they currently are and you know work on enforcement. Enforcement is something that's really, really important. Since 1968, I don't, I'm not aware of genuine, consistent uh, enforcement being done by anybody with regard to Section 8. There's a, there are a couple of uh, instances where, where some HUD staff had the time and energy and, and made some great improvements in a couple places, uh, but those staff now are gone, actually. Uh, and so we, we need to constantly um, suggest to HUD and to our members of Congress that um, to be successful, there needs to be genuine enforcement. We have Cynthia Wiggins trying to 
Um, she says her hand is raised. Um, I'm not seeing it on my end. Cynthia, if you want to try lowering it and then raising it again, we can see if it will pop up here so that I can unmute you. There you are. Cynthia? Cynthia, are you there? Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to contribute that. I think that where there are already resident Section 3 businesses established, that through the alternative procurement process, HUD should have something now, um, since we have this opportunity to say to PHAs that they should issue solicitations that allow these Section 3 businesses specifically to apply for those services that they're trying to contract out and not put it out in the private market where those uh, residents uh, own businesses have to compete with um, an industry that could have been doing this kind of work for longer than they have and just afford them the opportunity to be able to do business with the agency directly themselves through that alternative procurement process. That's a great suggestion. I didn't think about that. And and there's some language in the preamble to the proposed rule about procurement, but procurement is such a, a, a dizzying concept that I frankly just skipped over it. So uh, thank you. That's a great suggestion. We have uh, Adriana O'Neill. Would it be possible for Section 8 residents to co-op or buy the private light tech building they are living in as a Section 3 business? Say that one more time, please. Sure. Would it be possible for Section 8 residents to co-op or buy the private light tech building they are living in as a Section 3 business? Well, that's way beyond my technical capacity about what... Um, uh, project-based Section 8 residents can do. Um, uh, I, that's, that's, I'm sorry, I don't, that's too technical for me. Uh, if you've got a legal service attorney uh, in your area, that, that they could help you um, negotiate that. I think, you know, probably what would have to happen, I, I don't, don't take this as a bank, I'm just making this up, uh, but, you know, they could form their own sort of like uh, organization, their own uh, nonprofit entity, and therefore uh, try to uh, become the general partner of the low-income housing tax credit process. She said Section 8 will pay for a mortgage. That was her follow-up. The, um, the, yeah, it's sort of like the whole idea uh, with Section 8 is that um, there's a stream, um, a ba basically a guaranteed stream of rental assistance coming from HUD. And like with the, the, the RAD program, uh, uh, PHAs or go to um, the, the private mortgage uh, market and say, look, here's 20 years of guaranteed revenue. Uh, make us a, give us a mortgage loan, and we we know we this will. And then we do the underwriting, and we'll know whether or not uh, we can pay it back. So that's that's a possibility, but that's a, that's a difficult technical thing, and you need a, you know some real experts to work with you on that. And I'm not that expert. Charlene Nimmin says that Section 3 clause needs to be needs to remain intact. Again, enforcement is the primary issue across the board. And Mrs. Brown, I believe, was following up to the comment from Adriana saying it depends on the regulatory agreement with LIHTC. There you go. <laughs> Mrs. Brown, you got to come on down here and you know, <laughs> enjoy me on this. You, you got to, you're in the know. <laughs> All right, we have a Josephine Russo. Josephine, are you there? Josephine, you're unmuted. Did you have a question or feedback? No longer there. So I think we are good to go. All right. Um, just so that you know, uh, there, there's no time limit on this webinar. We can go all night. I can, <laughs> could be could be fun. So, but I'm going to continue on. Uh, the next topic is uh, about employment priorities. Someone kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, PHAs, contractors, and subcontractors must make so-called best efforts to provide employment and training to Section 3 workers in the following order of priority. Um, the first priority should go to residents of the public housing project funded with public housing. Makes sense. The next level of priority are the residents of the PHAs, other public housing projects, or residents with vouchers or project-based rental assistance. 
The latter part about the Section 8 residents is something new in the proposed rule. Uh, it seems like a, a great uh, improvement over the existing reg. The existing regs otherwise look, look exactly like this. Um, the third level of priority are something called youth build participants. Uh, there's more, a little bit of a dem uh, description on page 56. I won't go into this. Uh, it was a small program in HUD a million years ago. It's a small program still at the Department of Labor. And then the fourth level of priority, uh, when you get down to the bottom, as, as it were, would be other people in the metro area or non-metro county uh, who have incomes less than 80% of the area median income. Uh, there are also um, contracting priorities in the proposed rule. Um, PHAs, contractors, and subcontractors must make best efforts, again, to award contracts and subcontracts to businesses that provide economic opportunity to Section 3 workers. And then the, the, it has the same uh, order of priority as we just talked about uh, with employment. So now, at long last, as promised, we're going to talk about benchmarks. I know you've all been just, you know, holding your breath waiting to hear about this. So the idea of a benchmark will replace the current rules goals. Uh, the proposed benchmark has two parts. Part one is Section 3 workers make up 25% of the total number of labor hours worked by all workers. And number two, targeted Section 3 workers make up 5% of the total number of labor hours worked by all workers. I'm going to test your patience again and, and say, be, bear with me. I'm going to describe uh, a targeted Section 3 worker in just a minute. Um, but in other words, with this benchmark, it's, they're saying that 30% of all labor hours worked uh, are to be by the com combination of Section 3 workers and targeted Section 3 workers. Now, in the um, uh, preamble to the proposed rule, uh, HUD says professional services are not included in the benchmark. HUD gives us some examples of, uh, non, uh, of uh, professional services, non-construction services, such as legal services, financial consulting, accounting, things like that. HUD says that PHAs may include professional services in order to decrease their total numbers in order to reach the uh, benchmark that's required. Now, the current rule does include professional services, and I'm a bit concerned by uh, not requiring it because exclusion might overlook entry-level and career growth opportunities in those professions, so the sort of non-construction jobs. Now, I'll, I'm not done talking about benchmarks. Um, I have to. I will talk about it some more. But I first want to talk about Section Three. Oh, excuse me, targeted Section Three workers, in order for you to fully uh, appreciate what's entailed with uh, the idea of the benchmarks. So, a targeted Section Three worker would, and this is a new concept, um, would be uh, for for PHAs would be a worker who's employed by a Section Three business, or a worker who currently is or was when they were hired, a resident of any of a PHA's public housing or uh, any Section 8 residence. Now, there are two serious problems with this definition. The definition of Section 3 worker, which I talked about earlier, includes as an option a worker employed by a Section 3 business. So by repeating worker employed by a Section 3 business as an option in targeted Section 3 worker definition, this dilutes the whole concept of targeting in, in the benchmark. Now, on top of all that, as we already noted earlier, someone who's working at a Section 3 business is not necessarily going to be a public housing resident, a Section 8 resident, or any other kind of low-income resident. So I am prepared to recommend that option one be deleted, which leaves us with just option two, which again is a resident of any uh, of a PHA's public housing or any Section 8 resident. So uh, that's a complicated thing, talking about uh, targeted Section 3 workers and um, uh, I was wondering if I'll stop and see if you guys have any thoughts about uh, that that sort of gnarly uh, definition. Adriana O'Neill is asking, what if the PHA is a nonprofit? Do these regulations apply? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, J.W. Kim uh, said, 
Section 3 priorities are inconsistent among public housing regulation and community development regulation. Uh, if your project receives both public housing capital funds and CDBG home, which priorities are to be followed? Okay, that's a whole other section of the regulations, which I didn't talk about. Um, it's, it's in Part D of the regulations. It's about um, uh, uh, projects that have mixed uh, financing or mixed, excuse me, mixed sources of, of, uh, of HUD funding. Uh, and um, basically what it says is that um, if you're getting, it's really it's going to depend on the, um, the, the primary funding source. So in, in the example that you gave, if you're getting public housing capital funds, that's going to be the gorilla in the room. That's going to be the big chunk of money, and your CDBG funds are going to be fairly small. And uh, HUD would say that, well, you have to follow the public housing uh, uh, portions of it. And, and then, uh, uh, and frankly, I, there, there's a couple other options. Uh, I, I can't remember them now, and uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, I haven't focused on that because I'm thinking that's going to not necessarily be all that crucial. Uh, I wanted to focus on the big stuff for, for this webinar. Uh, there are some uh, uh, suggestions within the, the, the proposed rule that says, well, maybe you can do a little bit of both. Charlene Nimmin says these benchmarks do not comply with the premise that PHA residents would get preference. I agree. I agree. We have uh, Mrs. Brown on the line. Are you there? Yes, Mrs. Brown. Um, I want to say I, I support um, the coalition's uh, recommendation for the uh, benchmarks. And uh, but with regard to targeted Section 3 worker, the purpose of the statute, the regulation, is to uplift, empower, and better the lives of people in public housing. So if, if there's a Section 3 business, I would hope that the owner of the Section 3 business would hire Section 3 workers to give them an opportunity. Because um, it, 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 they serve as a role model. Not everybody in there should have to be Section 3, I agree. But to make sure that there is enough people to have that opportunity. And um, to exclude entry level businesses really creates a problem. Uh, there should be professional uh, businesses included in, in this benchmark and Section 3 regulation and go going forward. It's critical, it's important. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. B. Uh, and if you read the, 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 the preamble to the proposed rule, HUD explains that it has this sort of like two uh, option uh, uh, definition of a Section 3 worker that is on either uh, somebody who's employed by a Section 3 business or someone who is a, a, a resident, a uh, public housing or Section 8 resident. And HUD says in the preamble that they do that in order to encourage um, uh, the, uh, the use and the development of Section 3 businesses. Um, and we all want to do that, like, like you're suggesting, Mrs. B. The, the, the danger is uh, that, um, and, and, I can, the, and the assumption that HUD has, I'm thinking, is that they're assuming that if you are a Section 3 business, for example, owned 51% by low and moderate income people, uh, by low income people, uh, that's, who, that's who you're going to hire. And that probably is a safe assumption, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm my, my thinking right now anyway, and it can change thanks to your input, Mrs. Brown, it could be that, well, maybe I'm being too conservative and, and, and should back off. But I, I've heard other advocates also wor worry about uh, allowing uh, a section, a targeted Section 3 worker uh, be just somebody who's employed by a Section 3 business because because they're 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 assuming they, they've seen so many instances in which um, um, low-income people and residents in particular have not actually benefited from a Section Three uh, business. I think we are safe to move forward. Okay. So I'm, I I was not done with benchmarks. <laughs> uh, now that you understand a little bit about what a, a, a targeted Section Three worker might be. 
um, I want to remind you that I think that the benchmark should mirror the statutes uh, 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 urging that uh, employment opportunities particularly go to those who are recipients of government-assisted housing. So um, using my earlier recommended change definition of Section 3 worker, which you probably haven't you know, remembered yet, um, I'm proposing for public housing a totally different benchmark. And that benchmark would be um, public housing, Section 8, Section 811, or Section 202 residents make up 30% of the total number of labor hours worked by all workers for each job category, and that women make up 15% of all labor hours worked by all workers for each job category, and that 3% of all contracts are for Section 3 businesses. So that kind of gets at um, making sure that Section 3 businesses are part of the, um, the benchmark. So now, uh, now that you heard my, my proposal, uh, any, any feedback on that? I'm not seeing any. And again, I, I want to stress. Mrs. Brown. Okay, fine. I'm okay, sorry. you're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now you're being you're being very helpful. Thank you. What, what, what's trouble What's troubling for me? Uh, unfortunately, most of the households in public housing nationwide, according to the last statistics that I uh, read, there are more single mothers head of households. And that being the case, I, I, I would want to see more than 15%. Um, and, and, and that would be that would be my only comment, more than 15%. And that way, um, I feel that more women would have, um, single moms would have a little bit more protection and or opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. The, I got 15% from an advocate in Chicago uh, at the Chicago uh, Women in Trades uh, Organization. Uh, they have been around for a bunch of years and they work to help uh, women get into uh, the construction trades. And that's where I got that 15%. Um, I will take your comment back to them and 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 see how high can we go, uh, especially as you as you point out, uh, uh, most uh, households are in, in public and assisted housing are headed by single women. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. I want to I want to stress that the last couple of slides with targeted section three worker and benchmarks and all that stuff, it's kind of complicated. It's, it's taken me two weeks to kind of get my head around it. And so as you uh, digest this and think about it and have some other opinions, again, please uh, write to me uh, and let me know what those are, because you might not have them right now. Did, Brooke, did you say there's somebody else? Jennifer Mohawk has her hand raised, but um, it does not look like you've entered a pin on the webinar. Um, I believe I just, it says I sent it to you by clicking on this. I'm not sure if it went through, but um, once you get your pin entered, we should be able to unmute you. Otherwise, just type in your question in the question box. Uh, Alethea Sim says it's nice if there are that many women applicants, but if not, we use applicants who meet the HUD income standards. That's fair. That's, that's legitimate. I'm not seeing any others at this time. So just so that uh, you uh, know where we're going and where we're at, I basically have reached the end of what I want to talk about and get feedback from you on. But you will see that there are some other slides uh, that I, I don't intend to uh, go into because I think they're fairly straightforward. Um, there's a couple slides about safe harbor provisions. There are, there is a slide about reporting requirements. And I will say something about that, and that is uh, HUD, HUD is saying for PHAs, they only have to report once a year in their annual PHA plan. Um, we think that uh, PHAs should report on a quarterly basis in order to help residents identify the need for improvements as the year rolls on. So quarterly reporting. And then um, I, at the very beginning, I mentioned alternative two for PHAs if they want to consider the new hires option instead of the labor hours work. 
So I won't go into the details, uh, but there's a definition of new hire here, which has some problems with it. Um, there are definitions of targeted Section 3 worker, which has the same problems that I had with, uh, that I talked about earlier. There's an alternative to a set of benchmarks, uh, which would have the same problems as I talked about before. Um, and then um, there's an alternative to a set of reporting requirements, um, and that's pretty straightforward. Page 56 is a little bit about youth bill, so that you know what, what that's about. And then finally, the final slide. You guys made it. Thank you. Um, so again, here's, uh, here's my email address. Uh, feel free to um, send me uh, your future thoughts, and, and we will weigh them in, in how we say, uh, draft our comments to HUD. I also want to remind you that we'll be sending out a sample comment letter next week for you all to use uh, to tailor to your specific situation and really, really urge you all to use your own experience, your own ideas, your own priorities in order to generate really good uh, comments to HUD about the, section, the, the proposed Section 3 rule. Again, that is due by June 3rd. So if there are any other questions, Brooke? Yeah, so we have uh, Mrs. Brown. Uh, I'm just working on getting you unmuted here. Okay, you are unmuted. Sure. Thank you. I want to thank you both for this very important webinar. It's a lot of valuable information. And again, I encourage everybody to comment by June 3rd, even if it's just one sentence. Let them know how important this statute and regulation is and what you need to be empowered for self-sufficiency. Also, I reached out to Mr. Swiney at Motivation Inc. And he asked that anybody who's interested in the software or any questions, you can call him today or tomorrow or email him, and he will send you a package with any all the information that you need regarding the uh, software for small PHAs regarding labor hours. And it's Motivation Inc. And the phone number is 678794. Three zero six six, and it's Keith Swiney, S as in Sierra, W I N as in November, E Y, Swiney. And thank you again. And yep. residents, it's up to us. Uh, Mrs. Brown, would you repeat that phone number again, just in case people didn't get it the first time? Six seven eight seven nine four three zero six. Six. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you for reaching out to Keith, and thank you very much for all the great ideas uh, you gave me. And thanks to everybody else who uh, called in or wrote in with with uh, comments. A couple of others. Keep them coming. <laughs> uh, Alicia Sims wanted to comment that we have had one person who went from being homeless to having a career as a carpenter, um, saying that Section Three works. Great. Uh, Cynthia Wiggins asked, uh, can we send information on the alternative procurement process for Section 3 business? S send to me for my edification? Sure. I can use all the learning I can get. <laughs> and Patrice Shelton was also going to ask for the info on Section 3 worker and Section 3 business, um, which I believe should be included in our in the outline. Is that information included in? Yeah. What we will be sending yeah. following this webinar, including, it, including the, the, the the slides as well as even more detailed um, uh, summaries. Yes. Um, sorry, my thing just scrolled up really fast. Uh, Stanley Sunblade has says um, or is asking. So, when I am hired, do I have to tell the contractor what my family income is? Um, and then has a few other questions about um, related to the application process. Yeah, I think, uh, frankly, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not engaged at that level. Um, I th think it will depend on a PHA. Some might actually, you know, want to see like a W-2 or something like that. Others might just say, all you have to do is, is certify, sign a piece of paper saying that your income is less than X and you should be good to go. But frankly, there's nothing in the rule that talks about that. 
Um, and that's a good question. Uh, last one I'm seeing is Adriana O'Neill agrees with quarterly reporting. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia Wiggins is asking, will we be able to get your suggestions in advance for a review before submittal? Um, and yes, those uh, this information will be going out in the email following this webinar, correct? Is that? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Will we be able to get your suggestions in advance for a review before submittal? And I'm, Cynthia, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming you're meaning the suggestions that Ed provided on the slides today. Oh, I th she might actually mean that now that we've gotten some input from oh, residents, okay. you know, what we ultimately are going to be proposing uh, to HUD. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I actually started right, working on my comment letter uh, yesterday. I'm not done with it yet. And based on the input that we get, we've gotten from you today, you know, we as a staff will, will weigh it. And, um, you know, it's, we might not accept all of it. We hopefully will. Um, I hadn't thought about um, getting that back out to you, uh, but what we can do is, is um, when we do have a, sort of an almost ready draft, I, we can probably send it out to people um, and um, before we actually uh, send it over to HUD. She said it was, um, you were right, it was the ones going to HUD. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for correcting me, Cynthia. Uh, Alicia Sims says PHA should have a list of Section 3 businesses. They can make sure that developers and general contractors have access to it. Uh, they probably, they prob a, a good PHA should be doing that, yes. <laughs> Whether or not they all do, um, you know, is doubtful. Especially since, especially since uh, the there's been sort of weak enforcement by HUD. Um, so it's, it's the, the well-meaning, well-organized uh, PHAs that are doing that. Uh, there will be others, I'm sure, that you know, will do as little as possible to see what they can get away with, especially in the light of lack of enforcement by HUD. All right. Uh, Mrs. Brown is following up on that, saying to ask your PHA if they have a Section 3 coordinator. If so, reach out to him or her. Yeah, some PHAs do have, you know, taken the extra step and have hired mm -hmm. Section 3 coordinators. Good That's suggestion. That's all I'm seeing. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. And again, um, it's never too late to, well, it will eventually be too late to send me your suggestions uh, because I have to put something together, and now that I've promised to send out a draft beforehand, uh, it's even more important to get your ideas into me uh, as soon as you can uh, for other thoughts that you've had now that we've gone through this webinar. Thank you very much for enduring uh, all this detailed information for so long a, a time. Uh, we apologize again for um, having dead air for the seven or eight minutes, not knowing that no one could hear us. So. Thank you all very much, and please send in your com send your comments to HUD.